Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's Softree webinar. For those of you here in the live version of the webinar, please ask questions and engage with us through the Q&A section of the GoToWebinar panel. We address all the questions at the end of the webinar. And just for your reference, all question askers' identities remain confidential. For those of you in the future watching this off our YouTube channel, we do monitor questions in the comment section below, so please ask away. Okay, so today we'll be tackling three different types of projects. First, we uh, cover an example of an overlay and a road widening project, and then we we'll continue with um, a demonstration of a new road design in a greenfield setting. And then um, the last example we'll be cover will be a an example of a cover design. Pretty much every project in RoadEng involves starting by importing your survey data and creating a digital terrain model. Today, in order to be able to cover three project types, we'll be skipping this process. We will start each of the project types with the terrain model already created. Also, today's webinar will be a presentation of a video content we recorded recently. Three projects in 30 minutes leaves us very little room for a misclick, so we decided to record um, the workflows and we will talk you through it all live. Finally, we'll be ready at the end of the webinar with the project files open and we can answer any questions about them. And with that, I will pass it over to Matt. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, so uh, we've pre-recorded our videos for our session today. Um, just hopefully uh, it's uh, useful for you guys. This uh, kind of the benefits are there's going to be fewer misclicks and fewer or less time just waiting for uh, us to, to click through a, an example and uh, repeated steps. So with that being said, I've also uh, sped a few things up. It will be uh, pretty obvious what's sped up um, for the Greenfield example. Uh, I can't click as fast as I do. The, the sections that I tried to speed up are the kind of repetitive sections where we're adjusting our horizontal and vertical alignment iteratively. Um, so we haven't gone crazy with it uh, for just an idea of uh, how much has been trimmed up. The uh, Greenfield example, I think, went from 17 minutes down to 12. And the other ones, I think, it just uh, shaved off a minute or two uh, for those. So just a, a full disclosure. And uh, we'll jump into it. So the first example is an overlay and widening project. This one, uh, the terrain surface that we've created, is made with uh, total station uh, survey data. Uh, so for that, we've got. Uh, train features that we can reference to make our alignment. So we'll just jump right into this. Oh, and before I run the video too, there's a few items that uh, uh, I haven't duplicated on each video. So for setting up a data table, for example, I only do that in one of the videos. In another video, uh, I do a multi-plot, so I don't do a multi-plot in all the videos. Yeah, so I'm trying to focus on the uh, the content for each one, uh, the individual items like multi-plot and data tables are, are uh, common through. It's the, the same clicking, so just didn't do it three times. All right, so we'll start the video. So first, we're just going to reference our train file when we bring those in. So here we have that. And here we're going to tell the software that I want my uh, original alignment to be based off the surveyed center line. So this being a, an overlay and widening project, that's great because you don't want to realign it. You just want to match what's there. So here I'm going to set up my template uh, for uh, overlay and widening template. With this, one of the uh, uh, items that I'll adjust is I'll set, instead of using a crown or super, I'll set it to match the existing ground. So our crossfall matches what's there. Uh, it's not a matter of going through and setting your crossfall to match the, the super for curves or, or the crown for each individual cross section. So we're, our templates themselves are a holder of components. So I'm just going to copy a widening component that was pulled in from our e-library. And I've pasted it into our uh, widening one template that we've just created. We can see how it behaves in the other window. We can 
copy that from our left to our right to get a, a symmetrical roadway. And we can pull in other components to give us the cross-section geometry we want. So here we're pulling in our ditch. These components are largely just a fillable form, um, so you can play with the values to get them to, to match the geometry you're looking for. And yeah, this is another thing I don't uh, put together new templates for each one of the uh, examples that we touch on, um, but it, the process is the same. It's a template is a holder for your components. Uh, pull the components in off of either existing templates or uh, template per component folders from the e-library, and you can make make them do a lot of things. And you don't have to fill out each side independent left or right. You can copy one side and just paste it in the same way. So there we have that. Now when I hit OK, that's not going to update the cross section of my design because I've got a, another template applied right now. So to apply that template, I'm going to click Assign by Range. And I am going to add that in. So from station dot dot to dot dot is the entire extent of the road. And there we have it. So it does what we want. It's following the center line. It's a widening project. There's going to be more cut on the, the cut slope side of things. Uh, looks like it's doing what I want it to do. Down below, I can see my mass hall diagram. I can see the surplus material I generate. I can also uh, create a, a data table to give a more tabular output for that. So here I want to see my L station, so just the stationing on my left, and then I'll add in cut fills, and then the, the different volumes associated with the different uh, pavement materials. Um, one thing I don't do in the video is set my rows, so I just kept it at whatever the default row spacing was, but we could have configured that to show it in equal intervals or however you'd like for spacing. Uh, with this example, the template that I've used is a uh, fixed width for the mill section and a fixed width for the widening section. I've got this other template set up that uses a reference feature. So just like we referenced the center line when we started out, we can add in a reference feature from the topo surface. So here I've got uh, my edge of pavement. I can say that's what I want my mill portion to be and we could do the same for the widening portion and that just instead of having a fixed width we'll uh, look out see where the features are and match that up so if you want your mill portion to follow the uh, uh, existing pavement edge you can configure your, your template to do that as well and just to show how that behaves we'll apply that one Just check to, to make sure I'm not, not fibbing. So up at this section, we've got a little bit of a variance in the width of our road on the right side. So we can measure from where the center line to the widening starts. We've got 12.3 something, and then over here where it's a little wider, that road edge is following that. So we're up around 14.3 something. Excellent. So let's jump into the next example. Uh, so this Greenfield Road example, um, the example I used is a, a mining example. So we've got a pit that was already designed and we're coming out of the pit and we're tying into some existing mine infrastructure. Uh, with this one, uh, where it's sped up, it, it will be obvious. Um, and that's just a matter of there's clicking to get things right. Uh, for this geometry as well, the uh, Designing the ramp up out of the pit is the, the more time consuming part. So once we get the fig geometry figured out coming from there, uh, things will go quicker. Just like before, we are going to reference that topo surface. Now we can add in a background if we'd like as well. So here I've got some orthometry that I can pull in. And 
And since this is based off LiDAR data, I don't get a, a feature that I can just set that to go where I'd like. So I'm gonna move my starting point to where I'd like to start my road. And we'll start in the, the bottom of the kit there. And we can see the different views, see what's going on there. For our template for this one, uh, this is the default resource low volume road template. Um, again, just a fillable form and I've got a haul road template built. So this one has this more uh, mining specific functionality, bench cuts and uh, automatically generate a safety berm if there's a, a drop off on the low side of your road. And that's all customizable for how large of a drop off it triggers a, a berm and where you want your, your benches to be. Uh, so for this first little bit, I'm just going to start by clicking in my horizontal alignment and coming out of the pit, I, for the most part, don't want to fill down into the pit floor. Um, and yeah, I also don't want to be way off in, uh, outside of the pit and uh, cutting more material than I have to. So that's where this becomes a little bit more time consuming. Um, it's a, a very constrained example. and. Uh, a lot of clicking around in order to, to minimize extra earthworks. Um, the cut slope template we're using for this one's a, a newer template. Um, so with this, the and it'll be more apparent once we get it working up around the, the pit wall a bit more, uh, we can set the uh, bench gradients to match the, uh, uh, have them independent of my road gradient. So in this case, I want my bench gradients to line up with the, uh, the pre-designed benches of my pit. So here I'm just in the iterative side of the design, just adding a little bit more room so I can add in an appropriate uh, vertical curve at the bottom there. Um, our horizontal alignment's roughed in, but I don't have curves yet. So the length is gonna change. And, have to make a few adjustments on the fly here as we go. I should also mention too, this LiDAR data set, it's a fairly uh, data heavy example, but it's uh, easy to work with in our software. I'm gonna add in some horizontal curves and just to start, I'm just gonna apply the default horizontal curve uh, to all my existing IPs. And there the, length, the gradient changes because the, the length changed, which should be expected. And here we don't want that fill slope to spill over. And um, for me, I should mention as well, I prefer to design with an exaggerated scale. So I've got my label added that shows me my gradient I'm at 8.1%. And uh, yeah, I've also got my slope stakes added in there. So it's a little easier to see, um, just looking at the plan and profiles uh, where my uh, fill slopes are spilling over where I don't want them to. And here we can see the benches are matching up with the benches in the so as desired. I think we're getting close to having this pit portion sorted. And yeah, uh, a greenfield example, the mining example for this, uh, it's uh, the functionality for whatever your project are, is largely the same. Could be a, a forestry example, could be a a municipal example. Now without we're out of the pit. I should go a bit quicker, less constrained, a little more room to move things around. Here, as I click through, uh, my vertical alignment isn't being generated um, as I go. It's just showing me a 
draped line underneath uh, for where the, the top O falls underneath that proposed horizontal alignment. And then as we did before, we'll come back and, and start specifying some parameters to our uh, vertical. And that's where I want to tie in. And for me, and a lot of personal preference goes into this, um, but uh, uh, yeah, so I do my horizontal uh, rough in my vertical, and then I'll start jumping around between both my uh, vertical and horizontal to, to refine things. Um, and I should say that's if I'm uh, not using the optimizer. I'm not going to use the optimizer in this example, but it, uh, uh, it makes this a lot quicker. So you can turn the design into a semi-automated process, which will uh, minimize your earthworks costs and also reduce design time, which is pretty beneficial. Uh, so now that we've got things roughed in, I'll adjust, I'll pay more attention to my mass haul. Um, for this example, the uh, ramp coming up out of the pit is obviously going to generate a lot of cut. Uh, it's a mine site. The pit's got waste material that has to be spoiled somewhere. So I'm not so much worried about internally balancing this road, uh, but I still want to uh, minimize my earthworks. So the large spike in my mass haul is inevitable, in this case off the stair, but after that I want to kind of minimize my fluctuation uh, on the mass hauls diagram in order to minimize my cuts and fills. And it is iterative here. I'm pulling around my uh, horizontal alignment a bit, so I'm further into the slope. And getting closer now. So probably start adding some vertical curves here for that remaining section. So just taking a quick check to see how things look. Make sure there's no glaring issues in my, my 3D view. And adding in that vertical curve back there. And working through adding my vertical curves. One thing that's a nice feature here to save having to type everything out each time is uh, I clicked save once I got my uh, default. So this little icon here, once I set my default curve, so save saves the default. and. Uh, in this case, I wanted a, a sag of 12, so I saved it as 12, and now I don't have to set that each time I go to my different curves. The number set, I just hit apply. And we use the arrows to jump from IP to IP. Now here, I'm gonna add in a culvert. So this isn't gonna be focus of this just showing that you can work with culverts um, for uh, your greenfield examples um, and you know just drop the pipe in using the culvert panel uh, if, uh, bear with me while I navigate around to the location we can see the pipe in our 3d view we can play with its skew uh, if we wanted to we could adjust its gradient um, we could adjust its length uh, and we can adjust its size. So I'll just double click it in the list and change the size to something else. So not 100, we'll change it again to 1000. And as you can see, everything's updating in real time. So with that, one more peek at the alignment, make sure there's nothing looking funny aside from already looked at and then we can configure the 3d view uh, a bit more as well so if we want to see the actual surface rather than just the contours we can add that in this alpha channel setting it controls the transparency so it's a little easier to see what's going on so the darker portions of the road are in cut and then the brighter ones are fill um, yeah then it makes a bit more sense where that berm is and where it isn't usually for this alignment it's relatively steep so if there isn't a berm it's a, a through cut all righty and then we have our multi-plot so the multi-plot is going to take that uh, design and uh, generate a 
actual drawing package. So we could add in subviews and build this from scratch. We could add in different chapters and build a workbook from scratch, but we've saved a chapter or a workbook before, and we can see um, we've got everything populated. Uh, if you have something turned off, like my plan view was turned off of auto, I can manually move that around. Um, this one turned off of auto, we can turn it back on. And then that's going to get us right where we need to be. There's a little bit dropped from uh, center, centering the uh, that portion of the road, and we can just move that around using a shift and the arrows on our keyboard. And then we've got our, our cross-section chapter as well. So that's uh, in a few minutes, a quick design. We can save it. So, uh, location you're going to save as a DSNX file. Um, but if you need to stake or share the data with others, we have a lot of uh, options to change the save as type. And uh, a really nice fi file format to work for for that is uh, Land XML. So great for jumping between different softwares and great for construction staking. Now let's jump to the next one. And we've got our major culvert. So here we're going to use um, multiple alignments and uh, kind of an iterative approach to uh, account for our excavation. So this example is a uh, rural road um, and it's a pipe replacement. It's uh, LiDAR data. So if we had uh, total station data with features, we could just tell it to follow the creek thalawake. Um, in this case, I'm just clicking in my alignment, trying to match that up as best I can. Uh, and I'm doing this just to get the, the long uh, profile of my creek thal. Uh, so the example in this case is a uh, fish pipe. So we're going to embed that. and. To have it embedded properly, we do want to consider the, the overall profile of the, the creek. Uh, I've added in curves here. You obviously don't need to do that, um, but it's uh, the user preference. I find it easier to move curves around than a bunch of IPs, and I'm just trying to, to find the low point of my channel. And we can adjust those values that we've applied for our curves and get a profile that's pretty good. So you can see in our profile view the cross, the where we go through the roadway. I'll add in our vertical profile, so that's set. I'm going to check to make sure the template I'm using is appropriate. So I want to have room to uh, place my pipe and add a compactor on either side of it. So I'm going 2.7 meters either side of our, our center line. Our excavation. I'm just going to take note of where I want to start that excavation and where I want to end that excavation. So obviously I don't need to trench the whole creek um, and we'll just apply an empty template to account for that. So the bridge template has no cuts or fills. It's the default bridge template has no cuts or fills. And there we have that. Now for this it's an embedded culvert so my profile is set right on uh, the profile of the creek. I'm going to use this uh, shift function to shift it down. So we're going to put in a 2400 mil pipe. Uh, we'll shift it down 800 mils to get it embedded at a one third the diameter. Now I'm going to save this design as a TRX file, so a train file, and we will take the surface we've created here and if we looked at this in the 3D view here, we, we could see that there is a surface associated with it. Um, but we're going to take that and we're going to merge it into our topo. So here I'm going to use the merge train. And there we have it. So we've added it in. We do have to remodel our surface. So, and if you're not familiar with the software, this is how we build our, our train file to, to reference and location. So we forgot that. I'm going to just change the file name, top it with excavation, 
I'm going to come back into my design. I'm going to change the reference topo. And there we have that. So we've got our trench incorporated in the surface we're designing from now. I'm going to jump over here. Add in my horizontal alignment for my road. This one, the, the default template fits with what I want here, so don't have to mess around with templates. I'm just extending that out to hopefully get long enough to uh, capture the road geometry I need to match up. So I'm lucky that the well, we can do it either way, but uh, I don't have to fit a curve to that because it's on a, a tangent uh, for our horizontal, but our vertical is in a curve. So I'm just going to try and match that up the best I can, make sure we have something that's safe. And we'll add in a vertical curve. Now for this, I'm going to use the auto function. So I've got a design speed set at 80, and it's going to tell me what K value I need to, to get the appropriate setting there. And I have to pull that out a little bit further. The curve I wanted to apply doesn't quite fit. Also give me a little longer of a reach to match up. And let's try applying that curve again. There we are. Now to install our, or add our culvert, just like we did in the other, just going to add it in. I added a report point here, so I'm not just uh, right on the, the predefined report points. And we'll click Add. There we are. We'll change our diameter to what we'd like. Looking good. Now for this, I've got the gradient set to auto, so it's automatically going to match the gradient of the surface underneath it. So that excavation that we just did. And we can play with the skew to get us what we'd like. Now for this one, with our length set at auto, it's going to automatically size the pipe to extend out to the uh, edge of the uh, uh, earthworks. Now in this case, where we're going to backfill uh, material, or going to let it fill in naturally, however we do it, um, we can shorten that up a little bit. And Just going to go with 15 meters either side. There we are. Now another thing I'll do just in this case, oh, um, we can adjust the start station as well. So if you want to assign a start station, uh, you can. I've just set my start station so my uh, actual culvert placement is zero. Now for this project, I don't care to uh, do a bunch of excavation. If, let's, uh, yeah, really only want to just excavate 10 meters either side of the pipe. So I'm going to add in bridge component on either side of that. And there we've limited our earthworks to our actual crossing site. And that's that. We could make our data tables. We could jump over to uh, a multi-plot, but uh, yeah, we already covered that stuff. So. That is all I've got. And uh, yeah, I think we've got a few questions here. Uh, one is, I'm amazed by the interactive design updates in all the windows, especially shown in the Greenfield example. Do I need a supercomputer to be able to run this software? Uh, no, you don't. Um, so it's not uh, very demanding, especially to other similar softwares uh, for uh, idea of what I have. I've got a, a i7 a processor and I think 16 gigabytes of RAM. So it's a it's a decent computer, but it's by no means a, a super computer. And we do have people that can run it on uh, much uh, less desirable machines. And yeah, works well. Um, we also have a question about, you mentioned optimization. How would that have helped your Greenfield uh, design? Well, I, uh, I kind of anticipated a question like that. Um, let's see if I can find it. My files. I guess I should have had these open. Um, 
So it doesn't take long to run at all. And I ran it in this case here. Now, for that green field example, um, coming up out of the pit, it's not really a great example to where you want to optimize it. Um, maybe you could add in a, a, a full bench constraint. Well, even then it wouldn't work because there's you're filling on the other side where it goes through that creek draw. So for that, where you have something that might be, oh, I did it, where you might have something uh, really constrained and part of your design is really applicable for optimizing and the other part you'd want to stick to uh, having a lot of control. This example I will wait for. Just popping that open. This example, I told it that I want to run the optimizer, but I didn't want to run it from uh, station, uh, what is it, station uh, 700 and something. Just a sec. Now, with this, I, yeah, so I, left the uh, the by hand design, made a copy of it, so duplicated it and just said, well, how, how much better can I do? So we've also got some uh, costing functionality in the software. Uh, and so recalculating it, it came out to being a cost of 800,000, or sorry, 8 million. Um, and with this, I have to realize that I didn't optimize the whole thing. So over half the cost of the road is just in this big cut coming out of the pit. Um, when we jumped over to this next guy, we reduced 300,000 right off the top in a, a matter of minutes by letting the, the optimizer do its thing. Uh, the interface for that is just, oops, just in here. And so you set it up, you can apply your standards and uh, your unit cost for how much it costs to excavate, how much it costs to place that excavated material, and then how much to move it. And it'll uh, adhere to whatever constraints you add in there and minimize your costs. Um, next question. Oh, uh, yeah. So I think we just kind of touched on that. How do you get costs from the, the volumes? Uh, so this relationship here, uh, drives the costing functionality of the software. Now if I just hit recalculate, recost, so it'll take a moment to redo the costing. Uh, and the diagram down here is gonna get away from having just a, a mass hall diagram. It'll be our opti hall diagram. Um, so that's taking into account uh, your unit cost for material. If you have any quality constraints in there, um, you can show material going two different ways. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the costing side of things. Uh, does Mass Hall account for material expansion and compaction? Uh, yes, it does, and that's another benefit of this uh, Opti Hall graph. So the Mass Hall diagram uh, doesn't account for material movement very well if you have uh, really complex requirements. Um, say you need uh, one material with a certain gradation spec for one section of the road, and uh, but you can fill with uh, lower grade material through other sections as well. This diagram can keep track of where each individual piece is going and the expansion of action uh, for that individual material type. Now this example isn't a great uh, example for material movement. I've only got one material assigned for this, so it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, is there a more clear way to show the areas of cut and fill versus the 3D transparency? Uh, yeah. So I like the 3D transparency, but it's not great, especially if you're putting out a, a drawing package. Um, so with this, we can go to this, we can turn on our shading. Uh, we can choose whether we show cut and fill. We can also add different surfaces if we'd like. Um, let's try four mils for that. There, 
so we can see our cut and fill sections. All right, and uh, we're a bit over time. Um, and uh, I think we'll, we'll call it a wrap. If, if there's uh, more questions, we will uh, circle back on those of you that uh, we didn't get to. Thanks, everyone.